Vedeți pagina cu Marco Zanuso, da? Hello? Uh, da, da, se vede, se vede. Ok, ok. All right, so, um, uh, happy birthday to him. Uh, and uh, he was uh, very, very famous as a designer, but he also built some, uh, some interesting buildings. And uh, we are going to see them. Marco Zanuso, the architect with the soul of a, a designer. This is this is how I, I, I learned that uh, you know someone described him, the architect with the soul of a designer. Now, when we look at this, you know, we often use the word or the verb to design in relation to architecture, but when we think of a designer, we don't necessarily think of an architect. What do you think the difference is between an architect and a designer? Because obviously when we look at this, you know, it's clear that someone thought that he is an architect, but with the soul of some something else, and that is a designer. Uh, What is the difference between an architect and a designer? Well, I, I, I launched the question. You don't have to answer now, and you don't even have to answer it. I am I'm just asking you maybe to reflect on this. What might be the difference between an architect and a designer? So Marco Zanuso was born in Milan, Milan uh, on the 14th of May. 1916, uh, he was one of a group of Italian designers from Milan shaping the international idea of good design, as it was called in the post-war years. Trained in architecture at the Politecnico di Milano University, he opened his own design office in 1945. From the beginning of his career at Domus, where he served as the editor, <clears throat> from 1947 to 1949, and at Casabella, where he was editor from 1952 to 1956, he helped to establish the theories and ideals of the energetic modern design movement. As a professor of architecture, design and town planning at the Politecnico from the late 1940s until the 1980s, and as one of the founding members of the ADI, I don't know what that is. Uh, in the 1950s, he was he also had a distinct influence over the next design generation coming out of Italy. So this was the man, uh, uh, and uh, he seemed like like an intense man and and an interesting man. And and you will see that that he was quite an excellent designer and a very interesting architect as well. What I like about him is that, you know, he doesn't look like a star. He looks like a, you know, so-called so -called regular guy who, you know, is as troubled as anyone else. And um, I like this. Here he is with uh, other very important uh, designers. So the Titans, the Titans, the giants, the gods of the 20th century Italian design, Achille Castiglioni, Vico Magistretti, also an important architect Magistretti, uh, Marco Zanuso and uh, Ettore Sozas uh, from left to right. Vico Magistretti also, Magistretti also a, a very important architect, and here in the middle is Marco Zanuso. Uh, yeah, uh, very, very important uh, designers. Uh, about uh, Torre Sozas, I think I, I will talk this year, or I already did, I forgot. Anyway, and Marco Zanuso. Here he is with his own child. <laughs> As a regular guy, as I put it on the bench, you know, uh, of course he was a, an older dad, uh, but uh, he's human, no? Uh, we don't often see such pictures of architects, you know. 
uh, and I think it's 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 good that we realize that even the so-called stars, uh, you know, are human beings, and uh, you know they they uh, they have to take care of their little daughter or their little boy or uh, who knows what else. Nice picture. Uh, lyri lyrical rationalism. This is what was a kind of a label associated with his work, and I think it's a it's a it's a, um, a flattering one, you know, because if you are rational or rationalist but also lyrical, you obtain that uh, conjunctio oppositorum, the conjunction of opposites, and uh, because there are, there isn't so so too much uh, lyrical rationalism around. But I think uh, an architect who is able to be both rational or rational, uh, rationalist and also lyrical is already almost by definition an, an interesting uh, architect. And look at this. You know, uh, yes, the building is uh, perhaps not in, in, in the best shape, some kind of an industrial building, but um, we cannot say that it is not uh, expressing, uh, you know, some kind of a longing for for uh, growth, horizontally, yes, but it's 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 that quest that the the um, uh, metabolists in uh, in Japan, for example, also had. Arata Isozaki built a, a library in the 50s in Japan, which had the beams also extend in this way as a metaphor for uh, for growth for 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 the the extension of of and multiplication of of, of knowledge uh, i don't know exactly what zanuso wanted to say with this and I, I don't know what is the function that is more than structure it's not structure it's something is happening in those uh, rectangular tubes but i like the image uh, very much and now we'll go. We'll go for, uh, through a few images uh, of his work, and then we'll we'll, we'll uh, uh, look in in detail at some of his works, both uh, architectural and uh, uh, design of objects. Um, so uh, he also built uh, like this an apartment building, uh, and um, it's interesting actually. You know, it's it's. Maybe it's simple, you know, but but it also introduces the ornamental uh, uh, designs of the opaque parts of the building, and uh, it, it has something. It's not a banal building. At this I don't know what it is, but uh, it, it, it's very interesting because he was a, a very sophisticated designer, object designer, but he also liked an architecture that was very tectonic, you know, like, like this one. And uh, so there seemed to be a certain duality in his, in his, um, in, in, in his work, which I actually like because the, 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 the object designs that he did are very, you know, uh, finely crafted and with a certain artificiality and they're sleek. And here we have a, a you know, a raw, earthly architecture. And uh, this shows uh, his complexity. This is a factory uh, for Olivetti, which we are going to see later. Pottery fabric. Uh, this is a, a factory for, uh, for making pottery. Uh, you see the structure, how how uh, it extends beyond the facade of the building. Uh, it's 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 crafted in a certain way. It's, it's it's not banal. So in that sense, yes, he was an architect with the soul of a designer. We are going to see more examples of that attitude vis-à-vis -vis architecture in in some other works. Casa Arzale in Sardinia. Uh, this is a, a, a work again, which surprises one when you think that he was a very, uh, as I said, a slick designer in a way. And, 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 and in architecture, he liked a, a raw architecture, almost rustic. 
you know, and uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect such a such a building from an art from for a, from a designer, of, you know, objects. It's a good building. Uh, I, I, it's good enough that I, I used it for the invitation today. Uh, here, I would say he is more uh, lyrical than a rationalist, actually. He built several, in fact, uh, in Sardinia and, uh, you know, they are elemental, elemental in the good sense of the word. Maybe the word elemental cannot uh, refer to anything bad, actually. So um, maybe I should just have said uh, elemental. Uh, you, what can I say? I can only envy the people who uh, lived here or live here or, or you know, visited uh, during their vacation time. But it, it must be very beautiful to have also this courtyard and see the sea and have access to the sea and also to be rather primitive in a way. And uh, the, as I said, uh, elemental, I, I like it very much. I think so-called primitiveness in architecture is uh, is and could be a quality. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, as urban dwellers that we are, uh, very rarely explore uh, this side of architecture, you know, primitiveness. But again, this was an architect who was trained in Milan, who taught in Milan uh, for more than 40 years. So very sophisticated designer who understood the value of stone, the, levy, the value of wood, the value of, I mean, look at these chairs. He could have placed there his own chairs, right? But he didn't, he used chairs. These are not uh, Marco Zanuso. You will, see, we will look at his pieces of furniture. Uh, so he was not uh, self-centered and e egocentric. And uh, again, this says something about the quality of the man. I mean, I really, the, this house is, uh, uh, oh, what can I say? I, 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 I I think it qualifies to be in a group of excellent uh, uh, houses built by some of the best architects in the world. I like the intimacy, you know, the, and also, yes, it's a romantic uh, abode, a romantic dwelling. Marco Zanoso. And here you see the, the, the plan is, 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 yes, in plan, he is a rationalist. You see how he enters the rooms from, from the corner diagonally. There are essentially four rooms. And, uh, and, uh, and, but, but if you look at, at, at you know, the views, it's, it's organic almost, you know. So there is this uh, uh, balance between uh, uh, you know, what is called uh, order and what is called disorder or the romantic side of architecture, the lyrical side of architecture. I like it very much. Uh, you know, you enter, of course, the climate uh, probably uh, allows it. You enter directly from the exterior inside the rooms. And, uh, but it's this connection with the, with the, with the, with the courtyard that creates uh, the good feeling, I would say. I'm going back now a little to look again at, at after we saw the plan to look look again at, at, at the built uh, the physical reality of the building. I read somewhere I forgot where that uh, uh, God uh, God God what did I say 
In fact, in that, uh, in that, uh, through that link that Francesca sent you, uh, that uh, evaluation of the works, uh, the presentation of the works at the SciArc, one of the, the evaluators, a professor there, um, referred to a project uh, that, that worked with uh, uh, some kind of a, a reversal. And he, he mentioned that God read from right to left his dog. So, the, you know, I, had a, I, I made this mistake now. I wanted to say dog and I said God. Uh, I read that where a dog uh, likes to sleep and feels kind of a, at peace with itself, uh, that's, that's where we, we could say it's a home. And look at that dog there, you know, it's, it, it does feel at home. In, in, in this place, it seems. Anyway, um, nice work, Zanuso or Marco. Very nice work. Well, the landscape is beautiful too, uh, but uh, you know, in beautiful landscapes, sometimes architects build horrors, but it's not the case here. And, and the fact that he enters, uh, he accesses the rooms diagonally through the corner uh, amplifies, um, you know, a certain degree of, uh, of uh, unexpectedness and, and freedom. Although the plan is, you know, uh, if we look at the graphics, you would say it's very rational, rationalistic, rigid. Also materials matter, of course, because if these walls were white and, and sleek, uh, it would have been a, a different house. But because they are built with stone and the stone is placed, as you see, you know, uh, rather freely, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a good feeling of, of, you know, belonging to the earth. Vernacular modern. This is also a, a description or, or a wording I found in relation with his work. And again, it, this is very, very surprising because he, you will arrive at the end at his um, designs for, uh, you know, furniture and other objects and it, they have nothing to do with a vernacular. So Marco Zanuso, Casa Sale, Casa de Vacaciones is the one we already saw, but he built several. And uh, it was Janos uh, here yesterday who told us that uh, Off House is actually a, a website done by a, by a Romanian. And he even sent me the, or sent us the name. Very interesting. So uh, this was published by On Off Houses and uh, it's the same house, but he built uh, several, I think. And uh, very interesting, you know, it looks like a fortress, a mini fortress, but inside is very pleasant and intimate, as you already saw. Now, Marco, Marco Zanuso and uh, Adriano Olivetti, he had a good working relationship with a, with a well-known, uh, uh, you know, company, Olivetti. And Adriano Olivetti, I imagine, was one of the, I don't know, maybe the owner. So Olivetti is on the left and Zanus on the right. Uh, nice, you know, if you find a client like this who is enlightened and who trusts you and who believes in you and you have a good working relationship with, with him or her, it's, it's the ideal. Olivetti had uh, a lot of success uh, and so uh, he was able to experiment and you are going to see um, a work they did this Fabrica, Fabrica Olivetti in Sao Paulo from 1957 to 1959. Um, the building has a particular structure with lots of domes. Uh, made the dome factory in the fa in the factory of Merlo in Argentina. He built one in Argentina and one in Brazil. 
This one on the right, I think, is in Argentina. I'm a little bit confused, but he built two. One in Sao, Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil and one in, uh, in, in Argentina. I think this is in, I'm confused. Anyway, one is in Brazil, one is in Argentina. We just have to see the two of them. It was very unclear to me when I, when I made this presentation. Is it the same one or not? <clears throat> Maybe he built two similar ones, one in Brazil, one in Argentina, it's possible. But uh, it's interesting, you know, and it makes me think of the, the Olivetti factory that uh, Louis Kahn built in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, also with a, with a, apparently a rigid structure, uh, but uh, just like here, you would say, you know, this is a, um, serial art, you know, or serial is not serial, not S-U-R, but S-E-R. Uh, but but uh, if you look at, at the interior, because of the, the, the ingenuity of the, of the domes, uh, it becomes um, interesting and engaging. Olivetti, the, the company was very, very, I imagine that company, company is, is still on, it still, it still functions, very interested in design. You know, typewriters, they were famous, you know, the Olivetti typewriters used to be very, very nicely designed. And maybe I have to see at the end of the presentation if Zanuso didn't design himself a typewriter or two. But as you can see, he was also a very skilled architect. So, okay, we have structure, but if you have structure, it doesn't mean that that structure has to be boring. It's not because he had an idea and, uh, or a vision almost, and, and, and it became uh, uh, physical. Look, look how it was uh, built. Uh, very interesting, I think. So this designer was not just a hand that drew, you know, uh, appealing things or pretty things. He was a thinker and it shows clearly here, you know, uh, he was a thinker and a good architect is just that. Uh, I mean, not just that in the sense of nothing, he's nothing else or she's nothing else, but um, Yes, behind the form there is thinking, or there should be thinking. <clears throat> now, this is something else. <clears throat> something else. Uh, you see the typewriters. It is indeed Olivetti, but maybe it's a different um, uh, building, part of the same complex. Marco Zanuso. Now Fabrica Olivetti, now we go to the one in Argentina. So the previous one was in Brazil and this one is in Argentina. Uh, differently designed. I hope I have more images. Yes, very different. I made this presentation uh, one or two years ago. So I, I didn't uh, remember, I didn't uh, look at it today. Uh, but now I do remember that yes, indeed they, they are different. And yet the same author. Olivetti with big letters, of course. I mean, a proud manufacturer has his own ego. What can you do? Um, but there is order here and, uh, and uh, a spirit of modernity, which is obvious, even if, you know, we, this was built more than 60 years ago, almost 70. So this is in Argentina The look at, uh, you know, a very, here he is shown more as a designer. In those houses in Sardinia that we saw, um, the designer almost, in, in the conventional sense of the word, almost disappeared. But here we see clearly the designer, both in the design of the column, 
and those extended, uh, they are more than beams, I don't know what they are, uh, but it's interesting, it's an interesting idea to bring out of the building some of the technical visceralities. And this is a possible suggestion for, um, you know, almost any project. Um, you know, I thought, for example, let's say an office building and an office building uh, has lots of computers these days. And uh, most of the, I mean, the cables, the disorder, the technological snakes, as I call them, uh, the cables are, are, are not shown. You know, they are, uh, we have a sleek facade, uh, but, but the reality of, of, of technology, that less glamorous side of technology is not assumed and is not expressed. So I wonder how would the, an office building look like if actually towards the, 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 the exterior, towards the facades, we actually show the backs of what the computers are, meaning all the connections, the cables and so on. So you bring out towards the street, towards the exterior, you bring out uh, the, the, the actual reality of, of what most of the time is hidden. So I, I thought that you could create an office building which is very different from the ones that we look at or we build because instead of hiding what seems to be unpleasant, we externalize, but externalize in a certain way. Like here, I imagine, you know, these things were, you know, normally so-called uh, uh, hidden, but he brings them out. And all of a sudden, this facade of the building becomes engaging, interesting. Uh, it, it, it's an idea. Um, but yes, here you see the designer clearly, you know, in the, the column is crafted in a certain way. And uh, also what is going on here, it's, it's, it's a fine design. A very Italian also, you don't see very well this section, but uh, anyway, it is through this building. IBM headquarters in Milan, Santa Palomba, 1968, 1979. A fine work, you know, kind of international style to an extent, but, uh, you know, well balanced the volumes and, uh, uh, you know, there is a little bit of variety here. It's not a, you know, a flamboyant work, but it reminds me a little bit of, uh, of the Danish design, maybe Arne Jakobsen. It's not bad, I think. It is a little bit aged, you know, you kind of say, well, this is, you know, 60, 70s, uh, you know, uh, 50, 50 years ago or so. The Novo Piccolo Teatro in Milan, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a fine work. It's it's uh, it's austere, although it's probably a theater for for children. I saw the word piccolo there, um, but he didn't try to mimic, uh, you know, uh, uh, ridiculously an age which he he didn't have. I mean, a theater for children should not look like, you know, uh, infantile. I think. Well, maybe it's not for, for children. It's just called Piccolo. It looks like it when I when I see this uh, uh, this poster there or this banner. Anyway, the the work the architectural work uh, is very varied, as you can see from those factories in Argentina and Brazil and those houses in Sardinia. Now we see a theater, which is um, um, you know rather monumental. Well, I don't know about this thing here. It's probably not his, and I hope it is not. Uh, this part also seems to be a little bit too predictably with, uh, you know, predictably almost traditional with this uh, roofing. But otherwise, 
I don't know. I mean, it's perhaps not a masterpiece, but he did it. Uh, Manor House in South Africa. This is a very fine building from 1975. It's a large, uh, it's a large building. It's an estate manor in uh, Leiden, Leidenburg, South Africa. And look at it, it's here. You know, it's, it's, I think this would have made even uh, Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin uh, envious, both Taliesin East and Taliesin West. Uh, and, uh, and the landscape is, uh, is, is from Mars almost. This is, is uh, you know, uh, overwhelming almost. I, I, I don't know who would live there. You know, I would be a little bit afraid to live there, actually, with all that uh, uh, impressive God-made uh, uh, hill behind. Some sketches for this large building, and uh, it shows it shows skill and uh, skill. The, the thinking architect was was a skilled uh, draftsperson as well. So he was a professor at the Politecnico in Milan for more than 40 years. And uh, look at the building. Uh, again, I, I like these buildings which are, which are heavy, you know, using stone. Look at these uh, buttresses. You would see that you think that they are supporting a, a cathedral. It's a, it's a fourth. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, some kind of a... a uh, horizontal, I mean, you know, some kind of a citadel, some kind of a fortress. And yes, the, the, the landscape is uh, uh, impressive. Look at the building and the, it's, it's, it's a powerful building, you know, and if I would not have uh, had this, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, self-chosen uh, program to celebrate uh, architects on their birthdays or on, on the day on the days they die i would not have known of this building by this architect it's it's not an architect <clears throat> people talk about uh, at least outside of italy too much but look what a building he built this is not a building to ignore and uh, um, I have seen one much smaller done by Olgiati uh, uh, in, in Portugal. Uh, but this one, I think, is, is less pretentious in the bad sense of the word. It's, it's more uh, honest in a way, it's more open. It's, uh, uh, he, is, he was a different kind of person, Marco Zanoso, in my opinion, than Olgiati. It's a good building, but yes, very solitary there, I would say. Um, South Africa. I like to imagine that Frank Lloyd Wright would have admired this building as well. Because here we also see a longing for the horizon, you know, for, uh, for the, 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 the absolute at the, at the, at the horizon for the infinite uh, moving horizontally, not vertically. And this is shown also in the plan. A skilled architect. Now, uh, I don't know what these are some, uh, here, here we see the designer, you know, the precise designer of object designer, but I don't know what this is within the building. Um, because the building, <laughs> the building seems to have nothing to do with this, but uh, maybe that's why he's called the rationalist, uh, lyrical rationalist, that uh, this drawing seems to have a lot to do with uh, reason, what we understand by reason. But when we look at the building, at the built building, uh, this is a romantic soul. It's a lyrical soul. Anyway, I, I think it's a very good building. And uh, 
uh, reminding a little bit of those uh, houses he built in Sardinia, except that this is a much bigger building. Uh, he loves stone, obviously, and he knew how to work with stone. I think even the trees are happy. Today I, I saw on, um, I forgot, Desin or, or, or uh, Arch Daily, uh, an installation, so to speak, by Maya Lin in, um, in Manhattan, where she planted, uh, you know, dead trees as a reminder of what we do to nature. And I, I think, I think we should uh, be reminded as well, all of us, about uh, what we do to nature continuously, continuously. We keep cutting down trees when uh, the pollution is very high all over the world. And uh, I think Maya Lin did a good job as an idea. Uh, I, anyway, I don't have pictures here with that work. Although I show, I thought of of uh, presenting her work because I think it's important to become aware that we cannot continue to cut down trees. We simply can't. And not just famous trees, I mean oaks, any kind of tree or any kind of bushes or any kind of grass even, don't cut it. We need it badly, you know. The tree in its modesty is giving us oxygen for free and we cut it down. It's unbelievable, actually. We are, we, are, we are cutting down the branch underneath our feet. That's what we are doing. We are, <laughs> we are killing ourselves in this way by killing the trees. A work which looks simultaneously old and new is, is, a, great, is a great building, is a great work. And this, you know, you don't quite know what it is, you know, it could be an old building, you know, uh, some kind of a ruin, and it's not, it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a building built in the 20th century by a sophisticated Milan uh, designer. Good work, Zanusso, again, I wish I met you, I wish I knew you, because I, I, I like what I see. Why is it that we don't talk about such architects, you know? We should talk even tomorrow. You know, I mean, this presentation, and I apologize, uh, is, is, is not uh, the one he deserves. I, I should have had it more ample, and maybe next year, if I continue to do this, I will, uh, I will search for other works uh, by him. He didn't build so much, but uh, in terms of buildings, because he was very, very busy as a designer, and you are going to see his works as a, as a furniture designer, an object designer. But look at the splendid architecture he did. You know, it's mysterious, it's rational, but it's also mysterious or lyrical, it's romantic. Um, I like it. It's huge, yes, maybe this is uh, some, but then, you know, uh, that landscape there then allowed for something like this because it, it, it was as if, uh, you know, it's the only building on Mars. In my opinion, this is better than any building that Olgiati did. Uh, but we don't talk about Zanusso, we talk about Olgiati. Nature and man, this is what we look at now, nature and man. Or if you want to replace the word nature with the word God, God and man. You see the Milan designer at, on the ceiling. Uh, otherwise, the building is, uh, 
is built by an architect who didn't have to be necessarily from Milan. Now designer, Marco Zanuso is a designer. Uh, here he is, Museo del Design Lab. Uh, as I said, and you saw that picture with other three famous uh, Italian designers, the Titans, the giants, the gods of the Italian uh, design. He was one of them, Marco Zanuso. <laughs> you see, it's, it's almost incredible. He designed such objects which are refined and, and, you know, even subtle and slick and, you know, they are crafted very well, but but the building we just saw shows a different kind of uh, creator somehow. This ventilator also, this fan was also uh, designed by him and it, it, it was and still is, uh, you know, like a designer item, you know, it's valued. You know, it's if you have something like this in the house, uh, you know, you, you would be valued as a connoisseur. A lamp. Very versatile. I mean, to do this kind of design and then do the building that we just saw, this shows versatility and complexity. I don't know, is this a radio perhaps? Um, when I went with the students to Vienna, I bought from somewhere, you know, like a second hand on, on, a, on a website, um, um, some speakers uh, designed in, 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 in Copenhagen, in, in Denmark, but very much in the spirit of this. They also open like this. Maybe it was, a, you know, an inspiration coming from Marco Zanuso. I still have them. Uh, I forgot to put them uh, new batteries, but beautifully crafted a white cube, which opens up just like this. Uh, and um, everything is very, very, you know, dense and uh, beautifully crafted. Yeah, this is a radio. Nice. Here it is even with a remote. Now that's what designers do, you know, they craft impeccably uh, an object. But he knew something also about space and so on, about architecture. So there is a, there is a different, in fact, once I asked myself, uh, you know, what is, because I was thinking about what Louis Kahn said, that a great building should start with the immeasurable and then go through the measurable and then come back into the immeasurable. So then I, I replaced the word immeasurable with the word sign and then the, the word measurable with the word design, design and then uh, again, you know, the immeasurable sign. So I thought uh, the, the, the process in the act of uh, uh, creating a building could be approximated with these three phases, sign, S-I-G-N, sign, then design, the second phase, which has to do with the measurable, and then sign again, because you must bring back the building into immeasurableness. So when you say I sign, that, that first gesture should be uh, 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 the recipient and the carrier of an impulse that, that, that has to do with the quest for the immeasurable. So you sign and then you design in the sense that you break down the immeasurable into measurable elements and then you come back into signing. I don't know if, if this sounds uh, sufficiently uh, clear, but um, that's, what, that's how I try to approximate the relationship between architecture and design. The design, the, the design part has to do with the measurable and should be the second phase in the act of architectural creation. But here we are dealing with a designer of, of objects, not, uh, the, you know, design of, of buildings. There are plenty, you'll see plenty of materials about him as a, mainly as a designer. Um, 
I prefer to begin with his buildings and now we, we look at some of his uh, design works. Here is the man again. Hello, Mr. Zanusso, happy birthday to you. I don't know exactly how in Italian this is being said. Uh, bon Natale, no, they, you say Bon Natale at Christmas, I guess, but it should be somehow related to, to this. Look at these chairs, you know, made, made of plastic, I guess. Playful, you know, these are uh, maybe for children or maybe for the children in the adults who refuse to grow up. Uh, you know, in the United States, there is this saying, uh, I am too old to grow up. This is like a <laughs> justification for the, the adult uh, who is, uh, who cannot abstain himself uh, mainly himself, probably, uh, um, from uh, doing, um, you know, questionable things. Uh, a chair um, or a seating, I don't know, it's, it's maybe a little more than a chair. Again, the, the, it's truly, I, I, I think that that thing that I have, those speakers are very much in this spirit. I look at this and uh, it's almost identical. It's probably a design inspired by Marco Zanuso. Now look at this, look at this uh, incredible sofa, the Lombrico sofa by Marco Zanuso, uh, 1967. Uh, quite long, isn't it? Certainly for public spaces, you know, you, 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 you can't uh, accommodate this uh, sofa in a, in a studio. Uh, easily, or even in a you know common apartment. No, it's for public spaces. Now this uh, I don't know. Maybe they are not so impressive any longer. You know, half a century passed since he designed them, but uh, they are valued uh, works. This is an easy chair, Martin Gala easy chair. Um, probably very comfortable. These Italians, they know how to craft uh, everything, you know, from shoes to bags to everything. They have great, they still have great, uh, great uh, craftsmen. Now we see how it was done. I am personally attracted by the hidden side of things, you know, like here underneath a chair, you know, because there, there are things that need to be discovered and that tell you something about, you know, how everything comes into being. Because the, the, the facade, you know, when you look at this, but, uh, you know, the, the bottom of the, of the chair is, uh, is telling you more about the coming into being of the object or the building. sleep o -matic sofa. Now, yes, this is, you know, approximately mid-century design, maybe a little later, you know, 60s. Uh, but it's 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 finely designed. We have to we have to confess. Italian design, the modern Italian design. It must be very rewarding. And the good thing with when you design objects is that you know it's much easier to to produce an object that could, than than to produce a building. And um, so, you know, I think architects who don't have commissions or they are young, they could very well venture into the field of uh, industrial design. As many actually did in the past and still do in the present. Marcuso table. But looking back i didn't yet finish but i am approaching the end of this presentation uh, still i like the most his um, residential works personally and well, what is uh, uh, i think to be appreciated is that he didn't fill his houses with his own designs 
he could have put inside his houses, you know, as Le Corbusier used to do, and uh, even Frank Gehry does, and almost any architect who designs also objects, Alvaralto as well, you know, they export the furniture into the buildings they built. But in Zanuso, Zanu, uh, Marco Zanuso's case, I didn't see his furniture inside the houses he built. And I like this, it, you know, he could have done it, but he didn't do it. Another chair, very different from the, this one also beautifully crafted, as you can see, and, and beautifully des designed. It's very slender and elegant. Uh, and uh, this they, they shows knowledge about uh, about uh, uh, design. Yes, it does. There are subtle things here. Maybe they cannot be seen very well in this picture. Look at the bottom of the legs. You know where you have, you know, a transitional little element. I mean, these are sophisticated little things that uh, shows. Um, you know, uh, exquisiteness. Mobile housing unit by Zanuso. He designed this in 1972 for, a, it's a, a kind of a, yeah, the title says uh, mobile housing, but it was made for an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So this mobile housing unit was created for the exhibition, the new domestic landscape at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The unit was designed to be contained in a 20 foot uh, so container and intended to be deployed in emergency situation. So 20 feet is uh, six meters. And uh, here again, we see the designer, uh, everything is designed. And uh, now we also see uh, the, the creator of that radio uh, you know, uh, amplify the different di dimensions, the dimensions of a housing unit. And here it is. You know, um, in a way, futuristic. But it, it is rational, rationalistic, but also with a touch of that, uh, not euphoria, but that optimism that uh, the second, the, the first years or some of the beginning of, 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 of the second half of the 20th century um, had this, this belief in progress, in, uh, you know, uh, mobile everything, you know, in, uh, it moves me, you know, because the world was not like this and it's not like this and maybe it will never be like this. But uh, this kind of um, pragmatic idealism, if I can call it so, is, is perhaps needed today as well. It seems that even the, the workers there are designed, you know, I mean, the, the appearance, you know, that they, they are dressed identically and um, yeah, it, it's a mobile uh, unit that is uh, crafted uh, impeccably and maybe it could be sent uh, with a vehicle Elon Musk work, works for uh, uh, to Mars or to the moon or I don't know where. Marco Zanuso. Here is where architecture meets object design and uh, that's what we look at. But my preference still be, of course, this is a, has a different uh, uh, raison d'etre. But I, uh, looking back, I still like the most those stone houses that he built. Although I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind living in such a so-called mobile unit myself, for some kind of a futurist monk. That's it. So happy birthday, Marco Zanuso. And uh, 